This is not your average challenge video. There's no difficult obstacle I have to overcome. Am I a bad person for doing this? There's no glory that comes from me trying this. This is unexpected. I just want to spend 10 hours in Fallout 3's Megaton. Oh my god. That was better than I could have ever imagined. Is that so crazy? Well, maybe it is, and maybe I am, but that's besides the point. Let's jump right into it. I enter through the gates of Megaton, and my new prison is laid before me. The town sheriff, Lucas Sims, immediately approaches to welcome me. I instinctively run away and look at my pit boy to get my bearings. Now, maybe this was foolish of me, but I did zero prep work before going into this project. I've gathered a lot of information about Megaton throughout my Fallout 3 playthroughs over the years. After all, it's the first major location you discover after the game's intro sequence, so I see this place every time I make a new character. And I've made dozens of them over the years. I know this place. I'll just wing it. Here's my stats. I kept all my items in singular level up from the vault intro sequence, so I'm level 2 already. I kinda just threw skill points into whatever I thought would be useful. Surely winging it wouldn't be a choice I ended up regretting down the line. I did have two skills I knew I wanted to level up though. I wanted explosives high enough to disarm the bomb in the center of town, and my lockpick to be as high as possible so I could get into as many locked containers as possible. We'll get into that later. Anyway, I talk to Lucas Sims and he seems to think I'm a friendly gentleman. He also tells me I'm free to stay as long as I like. I think I'll take you up on that, Lucas. I know what I have to do. I don't need to hear it from him. I immediately walk towards the bomb to disarm it. But then I think, hey, I've got 9 hours, 55 minutes, and 3 seconds left. No need to do all the interesting things right away. Might as well chill out for a bit. At this point, I start going over why I'm doing this project. Let's hear what past Preston has to say about why he started this. Um... I don't know. Thank you for the insight. Thinking about it now, after finishing my playthrough, I have a little bit of a better idea. I want to become uncomfortably familiar with this place. I've spent so many hours in Megaton over the years, but almost all of those are walking to Craterside Supply or to the player house and teleporting away. I always rush through here, but with this project, I really got to hunker down and savor Megaton. This video is me going over the highlights of my 10 hour playthrough. But if you want to hear my unedited live commentary of that playthrough, check out this video. Watch whichever you like. Or watch both. After some rambling and getting jump scared oh. by Lucas, I come across this lad. He's hanging out near a Brahmin and, uh, picking his nose? I like his style, so I decide to give this generic Megaton Settler a name. After much deliberation, I settle on... Cowboy Jim. Because he hangs out with the cow... thing. I look for another NPC to name and discover this guy. The first thing I noticed about him was that he looked like a kid in an adult's body, with the silly baseball cap and glasses. While I tried to come up with a clever name, I ended up dubbing him Little Timmy. These would become my best friends over the next 10 hours. I said my goodbyes and went to explore the town. The town is pretty small, so there's not a lot to see, really. What few buildings are available to me, I go in to see what kind of loot they have. There's a couple vendors in town, so I'd be able to sell whatever I picked up. I could also place them inside my house that I'll eventually get. Right now, though, I'm just scouting. I make my way back to the front gate. If you've seen my tour of Fallout 3, you might remember there's a guard up top there. There's no stairway leading up, so you can't talk to him. Well, you can if you glitch up there, but I didn't want to waste a bunch of time trying to do that. I activate Vats to get a better look at him, and... There he is. Stockholm. Yeah. His name is Stockholm. I'll just let that sink in for a second. I walk over to the common house, where a lot of the generic Megaton settlers hang out. Most of them, including Cowboy Jim, are asleep. Except for little Timmy upstairs, who's just kind of spacing out. Already deciding to get on everyone's bad side, I talk to every NPC sleeping downstairs, waking them up. This turns them into zombie-like creatures. 
they slowly walk at you, undeterred in their goal to say a random meaningless line. Fearing for my life, I flee to a nearby bedroom and shut the door behind me. Before long, they immediately reach the door and try to get inside. You can see their models clip through the doorway as they rub against each other. But these are no ordinary zombies. These are... Teleporting zombies! This lady clipped through the wall like it wasn't even there. And then... This is the scariest thing I've ever seen. I don't want oh my control. gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was a jump scare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Ooh. Oh, that was funny. Okay. I laughed, but I was filled with fear. Cowboy Jim gave me the fright of my life, and I couldn't properly cope. Feeling defeated, I opened the door and let myself be consumed by the mindless Megaton settlers. After succumbing to the horde, I walked downstairs, only to notice that little Timmy had stolen Cowboy Jim's bed. While Jim was mindlessly coming after me, Timmy claimed a spot in one of the many then-empty beds. Timmy's a good guy. He must not have known Cowboy Jim was sleeping there. He wouldn't do that. He's an angel. In the morning, Cowboy Jim heads straight back to his spot beside the Brahmin. It's at this point where I learned some generic NPCs have strict schedules. I'm pretty sure the same guy always goes to listen to Confessor Cromwell preach in front of the bomb, and Cowboy Jim always spends his days next to the Brahmin. While I'm hanging out with him, little Timmy approaches. He, uh, starts bumping into a ledge and immediately walks away. Was he here to apologize for stealing Cowboy Jim's bed, but got too nervous and bailed at the last minute? Probably. As I approach the one hour mark, I decide it's finally time to defuse the bomb and unlock the player house. But then I start to think, what's the best way to do this? I know I could defuse the bomb at any moment, go talk to Lucas, and get the house key. But I wanted more. I wanted inside Mr. Burke's house. For those not in the know, Mr. Burke is an NPC you come across in Moriarty's saloon. He wants you to blow up the bomb. I don't know why, I've never done that quest line, and I never will. I don't have the heart to kill all these people. <clears throat> uh, earlier, I noticed his house's door has a very hard lock on it. That means you need a lockpick skill of 100. I knew I wasn't getting that anytime soon, if at all, considering I was only at 33. So I figured I'd take the simpler route and just get the key that was on him. I remembered from my previous playthroughs that you could report Burke to Lucas Sims. That starts this whole sequence where Lucas confronts Burke, and it ends in a shootout between the two. I knew that the both of us could take him, especially if I entered Vats at the right moment. Two on one? I'll take those odds. I go talk to Burke to tell him I'll detonate the bomb. Then I immediately go to Lucas and rat out Burke. We begin our march to take him out. Yeah, let's go get him. Let's go shoot his head off. Yeah, wasteland justice. Yeah. I'm going this way. There you go. Yeah, let's go get him. Close that off, yeah! We burst through the doors of Moriarty's saloon and confront Burke. He's indignant at first, but he eventually agrees to come along. I unsheathe my weapon so I can mag-dump into Burke the moment Lucas opens fire. Oh! I've made a grave mistake. Oh no. I made a grievous error in judgment. I forgot that Burke kills Lucas before he can even retaliate. I did have a sneaking suspicion something might go wrong. Here's me moments before that engagement. I hope this doesn't go horribly wrong and Burke kills him for some reason. Somehow. And you want to know the worst part? Burke doesn't even have the house key on him. There is no key to his house. It doesn't exist. The lovable town sheriff died for nothing. I immediately equipped his duster and hat and became the new town sheriff, Sheriff Bill Johnson. I take what I can from Burke and Lucas and promptly leave. Lucas Sim's son, Harden. Oh, yeah, he has a son, by the way. His son greets me as soon as I leave the saloon. He somehow knows that his dad is dead already. 
tells me to come to him for a reward after I disarm the bomb, and walks home. How traumatizing must that be? Your dad is guided into a situation where he gets shot in the back and killed, all by this nice guy that just wandered into town. You see that guy literal minutes after his death and he's wearing your dad's clothes. I truly feel bad for Harden. As bad as one can feel for an NPC in a computer program. Dejected, I go to disarm the bomb. I could have done this from the start, but I was greedy. I wanted whatever was behind that juicy, very hard lock. I guess its contents will remain a mystery for the time being. I talk to Harden, completing the Power of the Atom quest, and receive my house key. I also gain enough XP to level up. It was at this point I knew I had to take my level up seriously. It truly set in that I only have so much XP to gain in this tiny town, and by extension, so many skill points. Knowing that raising my lockpick as high as possible would get me into some juicy locked containers, I put nearly all my points into it. And a few into barter, for some reason. I also grabbed the thief perk to raise my lockpick even higher. With that, my skill was roughly in the 60s, and could even be raised a little bit higher with the right gear. With 60 lockpick, I could get into very easy, easy, and average locks. But hard and very hard locks were just out of my grasp. I would need one more level to get into hard locks, and two for very hard locks. Were there enough XP granting activities in this town to grant me two whole levels? I had completed the only quest I could without leaving, and all that was left was picking locks and hacking terminals, as well as a third option. But I would never do that. I'm just friendly vault dweller turned sheriff, Bill Johnson. Later on in the day, I head over to greet Cowboy Jim. He's his usual quiet self, but then I notice something. Little Timmy is gone. Before, I'd only seen him walk one path between two destinations, and his silly baseball cap and glasses wearing self is nowhere to be seen. Do generic NPCs just disappear? Cowboy Jim is a generic megaton settler, and he's where he was the previous day, but I didn't pay attention to any others. After a couple minutes search, I decide to leave him be. Maybe he'll show up eventually, or maybe he left town for good. He's a grown man-child. He can do what he wants. I spent some time looking for all the different locks in town. There were a lot of buildings, and I wanted to take mental notes of where the interesting lock containers were. In that search, I found this guy in Moriarty's saloon. He was just staring at the ground for god knows how long before I entered. I would say he's weird, but pot calling the kettle black, whatever. He pieces out when I make myself known. I exit the bar, and it's nighttime. I eventually walk past Confessor Cromwell, you know, the local leader of the crazy cult, Children of Adam. He greets me by saying, Light shine upon you, Sheriff. He called me Sheriff. He, he recognizes my role. That's really cool. He recognized that I was wearing Lucas Sims' outfit. Kinda makes me feel bad for getting Sims killed. Anyway, I head to my house for the night. I spend some time looking at the objects placed around. I notice some cans on a shelf, so I add some of my own so they can be with our friends. I also set my table for breakfast. I'm having squirrel stew. As we approach hour two, I begin a new ritual. Every hour, we listen to one of Wadsworth's amazing jokes. Photons have mass? I didn't even know they were Catholic. <laughs> I give that one a four out of five. Great joke, Wadsworth. I promptly forget about my squirrel stew and go outside. I had decided I wanted to spend hour two doing the water leak repair on March Quest. It's not listed in the quest journal, so it's not really a traditional quest, it's more in the down low. There's leaks around town and you fix them, simple as that. Filled with determination, I approach one of these leaks, ready to help out the town and be a productive member of society. Oh man. Completely forgot. I forgot there was a skill check. We need 30 repair and I only have 23. Uh, oh, but I have a Vault 101 Utility Jumpsuit. That gives plus five repair, still below 30. 
thankfully, there's one other way to bump me up. Mentats. Mentats is a consumable that gives plus 5 to intelligence and perception. For every point of intelligence, you get plus 2 repair. All I need is one more intelligence point, which bumps me up to 30 repair. Let's take it real quick. I can't believe how lucky I am that this is all I need. It didn't give me any points. I'm already at max intelligence. You can't go over 10 in any of the main stats, so I didn't get any points in repair. I felt defeated. Not only because I didn't have enough repair, but because it's my fault. If I had known I needed 30 repair, I would have allocated just two extra points during any of the level ups. Oh well, that's part of the journey, I guess. I'd get around to working that whole thing out later. For now, I started the Wasteland Survival Guide. This is a quest you can start in Megaton, but the majority of it asks you to go out to various points of the wasteland and complete some bizarre objective. There was one part of it I could do, though. Moira Brown, the owner of Craterside Supply, wants to see you heavily irradiated. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a pretty big source of radiation in the center of town. So I do what I do in every Fallout 3 playthrough. I walk straight up to the atom bomb and just stand beside it. I'll drink the water it's sitting in if I'm feeling particularly impatient. I report back to Moira, positively glowing. What does she give me for my troubles? For drinking atomic bomb water? She messes up my DNA, and now my limbs heal when I'm heavily irradiated. Very useful, and not extremely situational. Thanks, Moira. Later, I come across a poem and a story in one of the residents' houses. I actually read them out loud. <clears throat> what shall we do, Mr. Wallingsworth? Molly asked. Mother will be home shortly, and I've yet to clean- Oh, okay, that's enough of that. I'm not used to reading a story like that. Cut me a break. If you want to hear me struggle through it, it's in the unedited video. Hours 2 and 3 were low points for me. I spent a lot of these hours just walking around, rambling. I did have some interesting thoughts, though. How did this crater the town is built around come to be? Obviously, your mind jumps to the bomb that dropped, but it didn't explode. It's sitting in its own little crater where the water pools up. So what caused this larger crater surrounding the smaller crater? I don't think there was always a big hole here. Look at these pipes sticking out of the ground. Did ground level used to be a bit higher than where these pipes are? I don't know. It's just something I thought of, and I'm curious if the people at Bethesda who designed the town thought about that. The third hour begins, and it's time to hear a new joke from Wadsworth. My humor emitter array requires recharging. Not a joke. Zero out of five. I also come across this Megaton Settler, who looks a lot like a lost friend. When I was looking for little Timmy, I was looking for his iconic cap and glasses, but I vaguely remember him having facial hair like this. So I went back to check the footage, and here's the two of them side by side. I think this might be him. I'm so used to NPCs wearing the same clothes every day like Spongebob, I didn't expect him to change. I wasn't 100% sure though. Maybe the game spawned in an NPC with a similar look to him? I decided I'd wait a while before I could definitively say if this was Little Timmy or not, to see if any other NPC would change outfits or equipment. Hour 3 passes in a flash, and we're already at Hour 4. Let us be graced with another joke from Wadsworth. Photons have mass? I didn't even know they were Catholic. Huh. Um, it's a 4 out of 5 joke, but you don't get any points for repeating one you already said. I spent more of this hour walking around, doing nothing of importance. Since I did get Lucas Sims killed earlier, I thought it best to give Harden my condolences. And also just to check out his house. On a shelf, Lucas has an earnings clipboard. This really got to me for some reason. Why would Lucas Sims, the mayor of a small town in the post-apocalypse, have a clipboard with printed paper that seems to be from a spreadsheet? Did he print this himself? Is this from some random pre-war company that he decided to keep in his home? Neither of those answers sit right with me. I can definitely say he didn't print it from his computer. It has a giant hole in it. Why is this here? It's literally just taking up space. There's no way this is used for anything. If my computer had a giant hole in it and I had no way of fixing it, 
I'd throw it out. Just some bizarre interior design decisions from the developers. I come downstairs and see Hardened Sims, Blair Witch in it. He's Blair Witch in it right now. Except it's a fridge. Eh. He lunges for me and I run away in fear. I make my way to the Brass Lantern, a restaurant right beside the bomb at the bottom of town. I'm pointlessly looking around at the decorations when, hey, that's not your hat and glasses. Walking right outside, I notice this guy sitting down close to where little Timmy was standing when I first met him. I guess NPCs do change clothes. Which raises the question, when do they do that? Is there some random chance for them to change clothes when they enter or exit a building? Or do they have to physically have access to that outfit from a container or pick it up off the ground? I figured some things are better left as mysteries and moved on. I noticed this weird bug where it's like the game doesn't know an NPC has a weapon in their hand. Cowboy Jim will do his iconic nose pick animation, but he's holding his gun so it clips through his head. I saw a lot of NPCs carrying guns around as the hours went on. I wonder how many of those people are glitched like that. It had been a while since I made new friends, so let me introduce you to Janice and Andrew. These are names I'll remember forever, especially Andrews. I totally didn't forget his name the second after I said it. I cosplay as the man who wanted to blow up the town and go into the common house. Apparently everyone else had came here too, and they were standing right in the doorway inside. They all turned to stare at me as if I had intruded on some secret dealings. Were the NPCs conspiring against me? Cowboy Jim, Little Timmy, Janice, and Andrew are in here. Something suspicious is going on. I should watch my back going forward. The next day, I'm leaving the medical clinic when I witness this. Damn. Cowboy Jim was attacked by a barrel. At some point earlier, I had placed it next to him, because I had a feeling the barrel would go flying when he stood up. Sure enough, it freaked out and even did damage to him and the Brahmin. Physics in Bethesda games are messed up. I'm always afraid to walk around skeletons in these games, because they, without veil, glitch out and do damage to me as they flail around. Anyway, halfway mark. It's five hours. Yippee! Oh, hold on. <clears throat> Yip, yippee! Let's hear Wadsworth's joke. Ah, do you know the best contraceptive for old people is nudity? Two out of five. Barely even a joke. Don't quit your day job, Wads. Here's another NPC with his gun out. Chinese assault rifles are held like this in normal animations, so it seems like there's something funky going on with some animation flags or whatever. I did some eavesdropping. Such fruitful conversations. Later on, I'm in Moriarty's saloon, looking around. Hard. Oof. Can't get in there. Dog meat? Oh, dog meat! Oh, there he is! Oh, I gotta take him. We're, we're, we're bringing him home. I can't believe they killed dog meat. Dog meat's dead. Uh, uh, that's me crying. That's what that sound is. I place the remains of the affable dog meat at my bedside, never to be forgotten. After taking a break from thinking about leveling up, I decided it was finally time to work on hitting level 4. With that, I would be able to fix the water leaks and unlock hard locks. I was doing a lot of thinking and math at this point, I won't subject you to any of that. Long story short, I wasn't sure if I was even going to be able to hit level 4. I needed 86 XP, and it seemed like there weren't enough locks to give me that much. For reference, average locks give 40 XP. This was the peak of my regret for not planning out this project. If I had done the tiniest bit of research, I wouldn't have wasted all those skill points early on. It felt like I would never be able to unlock all those juicy locks and fix the water leaks. Unless I were to... No, no, I can't do that. I can't betray the trust of all these people I've spent so much time with. I can't just kill them! Alright, level 4. I allocate just enough points into repair so that I'll be at level 30 while I'm wearing the Vault Utility jumpsuit. And I throw the rest into lockpick. I take the Thief perk for a third time. 
Before I leave the public restroom that was home to the XP dispenser, I prop the guy up so it's not so obvious he's dead. Ignore the bloodstains over here. On my way to fix the water leaks, I listen to Wadsworth's joke for hour six. My humor emitter array requires recharging. Again, not a joke. Not even worth a rating. I'm so glad I finally get to repair these. Walter gives you 200 caps for fixing them, as well as a tiny bit of caps and XP for each piece of scrap metal you turn in. Was kinda hoping I'd get more from that, but oh well. At least I got it done. I find myself in Moriarty's saloon again. I didn't notice at first, but Burke's body disappeared. Lucas Sim's body is sitting right where I left it, but Burke is nowhere to be seen. Not sure what to make of that. While I was looting Lucy West's house, the lady who generously donated XP to my level 4 fund, I found the hockey mask armor piece, which gives plus 5 points to... unarmed? What? Why doesn't it give plus 5 to melee weapons? Come on, that's the easiest reference in the world. Even I, a poor dumb schlub, could think of that. Get it together, Bethesda. This was the beginning of my kleptomaniac era. I start taking everything from buildings. I clean up the water processing plant, as well as take what I can from the Sims household without Harden yelling at me. I take a short break from my item grabbing to balance some noodle bowls on these stools. Totally haven't lost my mind yet, by the way. My next target is Jericho's house. He's a badass mercenary that you can hire to be your companion. After stealing his precious tin cans and whiskey bottles, I notice he has a teddy bear under his bed. Oh, Jericho has a teddy bear. That's adorable. See, that's not something I wouldn't have noticed. I would have noticed if I hadn't done this video. Realizing it's been a while, I treat myself to a new look. I like this. I'm really growing out of my Vault Dweller shoes and becoming a true person of the wastes. After some more stealing, I become over-encumbered. Rather than drop some stuff and make a second trip, I decide to take the slow walk home. After all, NPCs don't run around town at max speed like I do all the time. I might as well appreciate what it's like to live life in their slow walking shoes. I find myself at the Brass Lantern after making room in my inventory for more items. I'm like a vacuum sucking up everything that's not glued down. After picking up a majority of the easily stolen items in town, I decided to finally buy something. I was going to purchase a house theme. I loaded up my inventory until I was over encumbered and began the slow walk to Craterside Supply. House themes are preset designs for the player house that you can buy. They're roughly 1400 caps, not too expensive, but not too cheap. There's a handful of themes to pick from, and since money was in such short supply, I had to choose wisely. Pining for a simpler time, I chose the pre-war theme. I thank Moira for the sale by stealing some of her items and head home. I like it. A lot more decorated than I thought. I was planning to place items on the shelf myself, but Moira did a good job. She even put food at the table where I placed some earlier. I tweaked the setup so it feels a little bit more comfortable for Bill. Joke time! Photons have mass? I didn't even know they were Catholic. <laughs> I'm starting to think you only know two jokes. I found myself in possession of two garden gnomes. I didn't know what to do with them, but I knew I had to do something. I settled on putting them in this upstairs room with a couch and a chair. I spent way too much time trying to get them to sit upright perfectly, but gave up at some point. Eventually, one of them starts Blair Witching, so I leave the room and lock the door. Then I see how high I can stack some books. This is a true test of my mastery of Fallout 3's physics system. What is this, 8? That's my high score. At this point, I'm struck with divine inspiration. If I can't stack the books in a perfect tower, I'll just pile them up. So that's what I did. I begun my mission to collect every burned book in Megaton and put them on this table. I already had a lot because of my kleptomaniac era, but I knew there were more to be had. Some that were a bit more difficult to steal. But I wasn't going to let that stop me. I was on a mission from God. I beelined it straight for the Children of Adam building. I distinctly remember a cache of books that was right in the open. It'd be difficult to take, but I knew I had to- Oh, that was easy. I also discovered the holy text. The small ruined book at the lectern where sermons were likely given. 
This had to be in my collection. I left it here as to not be mixed up with my other small ruined books. I'd return for it later. I pile up those books and empty my inventory so I'm at zero weight. Don't think I've ever been at zero weight in a Bethesda game. Next up is a more generalized stealing phase. Cleaning up some houses I missed earlier, which grants me even more books. Some more piling, and I've gathered what I think is every ruined book in town. Well, except for one. I've returned to the Children of Adam. They might not forgive me for what I'm about to do, but what they don't know won't hurt him. At least in the short term. I snatch the book and go home. I carefully place the wholly ruined book on a coffee table, separate from my main collection. I take a step back and observe my magnum opus. 58 books in total. I truly feel accomplished. But this was the calm before the storm. There had been something brewing up deep within me for the past eight hours. I had spent so much time getting to know people, becoming acquainted with their customs, making this place my home. But it was time for a change. The Armory. A place I had discovered the key to pretty early on, actually, but I knew I shouldn't go in just yet. It wasn't the time. Now is the time. It's time to gear up and prepare myself for war. I make the trek to the armory with an empty inventory, ready to arm myself with whatever gear was in there. I open the door and... Uh oh. This is unexpected. Oh my god, they're all hostile. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. This did not go like I thought. Oh, gee willikers. I made another grievous error in judgment. Forgot Deputy Steel was in here. Lacking armor and weapons against this Mr. Gutsy, I promptly leave the armory. He chases me outside and the entire town becomes hostile. I die before I can make it to my house. Okay, round two. I take my preparation more seriously here. I grab my best weapons and armor, combat shotgun, Chinese assault rifle, and 10mm pistol. You know I got that blicky. Before things go south, I head to Craterside Supply to buy some supplies. Moira's final words to me are... Good hunting. Good hunting. Oh boy, that is a poor turn of phrase there, Moira. Whew. If only she knew. I'm at the door of the armory and ready to kill this dumb robot. I breach and immediately enter Vats. After fiddling with the ever buggy targeting system and shooting him through that, I unload some shells into him myself. Fortunately, this seems to stagger him and he doesn't fire as long as I keep the pressure up. Before long, Deputy Steel is given an early retirement. I take stock of the armory. Admittedly, not as much as I was hoping for. A couple of assault rifles, a shotgun, some hunting rifles. All weapons I already have, but useful enough for repairs. Alright, this is, uh, this is it. As soon as I step outside, I'm gonna be public enemy number one. But I'm prepared. I'm ready to take on the world. Let's do this. Uh, nobody's mad at me. A little awkward, but fine. I can use this to my advantage. I'm going to use the town's non-hostility to get some surprise damage on a powerful target. One that would prove difficult fighting without me getting a sucker punch. That person had to be Jericho. The same Jericho who sleeps with the teddy bear. He's not at his house, so I go to Moriarty's saloon. I think I've seen him there before. Oh, please don't tell me he's in the bar. That is the worst place for him. Wait, that's him. Alright, I'm just going to do this right now. Done. Let's dome this guy. Oh my god, that is doing nothing. Take out the shotgun. Oh, this guy is so dead. War has begun. Red pips populate the compass, 
and I know they're currently pathfinding towards me to preemptively end my reign of terror. But nothing can stop Bill Johnson. Among the first to charge at me is my best friend, Cowboy Jim. I knew this moment would come the instant I decided to take on the town. I was dreading it. I decided to give him a glorious death inside vats. You will be remembered. More and more people are taken out as Bill continues his rampage. Confessor Cromwell flees to the clinic for safety. I chase him down, and mere frames before leaving the building again, he passes away. Once I step outside, I'm challenged by the man himself, Stockholm. He descends from his ivory tower to bring me down and save the town. I bob and weave until I'm right up next to him, and, uh, you can guess what comes next. He has some pretty good armor on him, so I don my best Stockholm cosplay and continue my patrol. After dispatching some miscellaneous NPCs, I reach level 5. Not much to do here, but level up lockpick to 95. That, combined with the Vault 101 utility jumpsuit, allows me to reach 100 lockpick. But we're not done yet. Moira falls. All of Moriarty's saloon falls. And with one final shot, it's over. With an hour and 20 minutes left, the only living beings in this town are me, Harden Sims, Maggie, and Cowboy Jim's Brahmin. I felt bad doing all that. I knew it would make for a good set piece in this video, so I had to do it, but it just felt wrong. I'm never the person to make evil choices in these games purely for the sake of being evil, though I figured I'd give myself and all of you a taste of that gameplay style. My advice? Treat the Megaton inhabitants well. The video is not over yet, though. There's one more thing to do. I grab every single item in my possession, every single item laying around my house, and every item in its containers. I go over to Billy Creel's house to grab a few more items, and... What's a good... I'm sorry, who are you? I'm sorry. Who? Victoria, who? You've been rather busy lately. Asking questions, investigating. So is that, or do you have some kind of personal grudge against an innocent android? Oh, it's the replicated man stuff. It's a random encounter from a quest I started earlier. Needless to say, I thought I was seeing a ghost at first. She's not from Megaton, so I spare her. My pockets are full at this point. I slowly walk back to the armory, what would be the final resting place for all the junk I had accumulated over the past nine hours. I throw a Deputy Steel off to the side and begin dropping things on the ground. It's not as easy as spamming X to drop all the items. There's a lot of entries in my inventory that are multiple of one item. If you have more than five, a dialogue window appears asking how many you want to drop. If you select the maximum amount, and then when the item is dropped, they'll all be bundled together. So if you want the maximum number of items on the ground, you have to drop them one by one. Which is what I did. I spent 10 minutes slowly menuing through my inventory, selecting an item, moving the cursor all the way to one, confirming, and repeating for however many items were there. A tedious process, but one I knew would be worth it. I did this all without leaving the Pip-Boy once, so as soon as I closed the menu, every item would fall to the ground at the same time and the game would freak out. I mentioned earlier physics and Bethesda games are something else. I was really excited for this. Alright, I'm gonna press B, and my game very well might crash, but it'll be very interesting, so I'm nervous. I don't want to do this, but I am very- I'm, oh god, I'm nervous. All right, I just got to do it. Okay, three, two, one, go. I was hoping for my game to choke up a lot more, but I can't complain. Look at all this. Have you ever seen so many items in one place? This is everything I've laid eyes on and touched since I started this project. It's so majestic. I had forgotten one place though. Mr. Burke's house. The whole reason I got Lucas Sims killed was to get in that house, 
and I forgot about it. I walk over with my trusty Vault 101 utility jumpsuit and break into the fortress. I don't know what I was expecting, it's just a normal place. Kind of a letdown. But we cannot end this video on a downer like that. We must go out with a bang. Or should I say, boom. Yet again, I am struck with divine inspiration. I am going to throw a grenade in the middle of the junk pile. I pick up a frag grenade as well as a landmine from Craterside Supply. Two explosives will make the physics go crazy, no doubt. Alright, let me just nestle myself in the corner. Kind of a letdown. Let's try again. This sucks. Again. Again! Ugh, okay. One more time, then I'll just call it quits. Alright. This is gonna be... This better be chaos or I'm gonna be upset. Oh my god. That was better than I could have ever imagined. It was beautiful. And it happened on my last try. Oh, hold on. That was actually my first try. Sorry, I get these things mixed up sometimes. Yeah, it went perfectly on the first grenade throw and sucked for all the remaining ones. With almost 20 minutes left on the timer, things started to wind down. I reflected on my thoughts of the project and took one last stroll around Megaton. I come across Maggie and decide to say my goodbyes. You're the bad man that hurts people, aren't you? Ooh. Oh, that hurts. That really hurts. She's not wrong. According to the game, I'm very evil. I spent the last minute of my challenge gazing upon the town I had grown to know so well. I got a house. I made friends. I saved the town. I learned so much about Megaton and Fallout 3 as a whole. If you want to see some coverage of other areas of Fallout 3, check out my world tour I did last month. If you have any suggestions for future games I could spend some time in, leave a comment. Not sure if we'll do another episode of this, but I'm curious what you guys think. Okay, time's up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.